doing I'm so glad you're welcome to exalt I'm glad you're here stand together I want to read a verse to you right quick if you've uh, been joining us for the last few weeks you know that Roger Pastor Roger has been uh, uh, taking us through Jesus message to the churches in Revelation and some of the most beautiful things that I love out of a revelation are the views we get around the throne of God when people are worshiping him amen and what, one of the things says is talks about the angels that are surrounding the throne. And they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And it says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. Can you give him praise this morning? Thank you, Lord. Amen. So we're just going to do that. We're going to we're going to lift up our hands and we're going to worship Jesus. Amen. Let's do it. Here we go. Glory, Lord. I give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you. Whatever you want to do, oh yes, and your presence is an open door, we want you Lord, like never before, oh, and your presence is an open door, so come now. Grace has been enough, and I'm believing all the best is yet to come. Amen. Cross before me, my hope on things above, and in you, Jesus, all the best is yet to come. Okay. 
Good morning, church. I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I'm tasked with something, as soon as I consider it complete, I keep moving. Can you relate with that? Isn't it awesome that our God is nothing like that at all? That his work is not finished, that he doesn't just say, do you accept me? You're saved, carry on. But his work it's not finished that the story's not over that he's working that he's moving it doesn't matter where you've been this week i want you to know that god sees you he sees you and he is writing your story right down to this moment can we give him a round of applause in this place church absolutely I want to welcome you men. My name's Tommy. I'm one of the pastors here at Exalt Church. And if you are a first-time guest, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us. As you came in, inside your worship packet is a Let's Connect card. If you could fill this out during service, we just want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning. If you're new and you're wondering what to expect, there's three things that you can expect at Exalt Church. You can expect God in this place. As I told you, he is writing, he is moving, he is doing. When we come into this place, we lift up God Almighty. You can expect the truth through the teaching of the word. That you may not, ex you, 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 it's not that you may not receive the truth out there, you don't. I don't, but when I get into God's word, I see his truth, his truth about me, the truth about you. You can expect truth in this place. And you can expect love. You can expect the love of God Almighty. As I know when you came in, I'm sure you got a wave. Some of y'all got a hug. If Rosina was at the door, she might have tackled somebody. I'm sorry if you got a concussion. Just joking. Welcome in. We're glad that you're here right now. You guys sounded great. I was listening behind the curtain. Let's go ahead and continue to worship and lift up Jesus Christ with the band this morning. Let's lift him up, church. Great. 
breakthrough is coming by faith. I see a miracle, and my God has made me a promise, and it won't stop now. And I know a breakthrough is coming and by faith. I see a miracle, and my God has made me a promise, and it won't stop now. Praise, amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. He's good and he's worthy of worship. Amen. Yes. He's good. He's worthy. And he is our way maker. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Miracle 
the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing this, even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Oh, even when, even, even when, when I don't see it, you're still working. working. Even when I, I can't feel it, God, you're, you're still working. working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, oh. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel you, you're still working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Oh, you are a way maker, miracle worker.
I have been in the ministry full time since I was 17 years old. We've been pastoring Exalt Church coming on our sixth year, coming up in two weeks. And I have never in the life of my ministry, here or anywhere else, witnessed and seen the spiritual attacks that have come upon you, God's people, this week and this month. As a lead pastor, I had the privilege of hearing all the stories. Relational, physical, mental, financial. Some of those stories I cannot share with you because I hold them in pastoral confidence. But I'm not a novice. I've been in the battle and I've been grizzled, if that's the word. I've been battle ready, seeing the battle. I've witnessed it in my own mind, my own head. And why does the attack come? The attack comes because, first of all, you don't attack the dead, you attack the living. The attack comes when you're about to have a breakthrough, and then more attacks come to stop you from pressing forward. And what is the greatest way that we can combat Satan? Oh, there are times, yes, that I will turn and say, the Lord rebuke you. There's times I get bold and I'll say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. But the greatest way that you and I can do spiritual warfare is to simply stand in this place or stand in your home, lift up your voices, lift up your hands, and worship Him more than ever before. I don't know if you notice it, but the Holy Spirit of God is in this place today, removing. I see tears happening. I see people's hearts being softened. Listen, listen, listen. We don't want to miss this moment. So we're not going to say and put the focus on Satan, the Lord rebuke you. No, we're going to instead turn it. We're going to lift our hands. Because here's what happens, my friends. Ah, don't get legalistic on this, but I believe as you worship God, you free up the angels around the throne of God to go and do works. All right? So as you praise God, you're taking the place of an angel who is going to go do some... Okay, write me some emails on that one. That's all right. Here we're going to do. Tony, I want you to have the liberty, my friend, to take us right there. And I want you guys to go into that deeper place. I want you to worship him one more time. If you're in a battle, praise him like you've never praised him before. If you didn't answer... Praise Him like you've never praised Him before. If you feel like you're about to go under, praise Him like you've never been before. If you're depressed, praise Him like you've never before. If you're about to give up on God and walk away from your faith, praise Him like you've never praised Him before. Praise Him. And the chains that bind you are going to drop powerless behind you as you praise Him right now. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Take us there, Tony. Take us there, buddy. We sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God, and you're worthy, worthy, Jesus Christ, the saving one. Oh, praise his name forever and ever. Amen. Oh,
Amen. Claudia, I want you to come and pray. For, I want you to come pray for us, Claudia, right here. I want you to pray over us, okay? Father, thank you for another day that you give to us, Lord. Father, we come today, Father, just like Moses came, Father, with all the things around us. We know, Father, we need you, Father. Father, these people need you, Father. In the name of Jesus, Father. Father, all things that is around us, Father, is crumbled, but I end your words is nothing is going to touch us. Give us the strength, Father, when we don't have. Give us the strength when we don't have. And Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, look at the kids, oh, Father, they go through so much. Give us, Father, in this strength, Father, that we be able to grab them in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, I give them every family that is here in the family that not a here, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, I give it to you, pastors, Father. Father, give it the strength, Father, in the name of Jesus, to be able to preach, Father, the truth. We need the truth in this time. We need the truth, oh, Father, in the name of Jesus. We need the change to fall. We need the change that has been gone through for years. We need the change in the name of Jesus to fall. We believe in a God that is a good God. We believe in God that heals. We believe in a God that preach. We believe in a God that takes everything pain, Father. Father, give us a strength. Don't give us, Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give it to you, each family, Father, in the name of Jesus. Each Father, oh Lord, each pain that we go through, Father, in the name of Jesus. You are amazing, God, and it is nothing impossible to you, my Lord. I give it to you, Father, each person is in this house. Every need, we give it to you. We put it on your feet, oh Lord. We need you more and more, Father. The time is so short and we don't know, Father. But we don't want it to be, Father, that we don't know what to do. Father, you are the way, the truth, and the light, oh Father, in the name of Jesus. I give it to you, Father, everything, Father, in my life. Everything, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, that we be able to move forward every day, Father. We don't care what goes run. We believe in a God that is a good God. We believe in a God that is amazing God. We believe in that you want to go through, Father, with every single one. Father, you have a story for everyone. We have a story, Father. We have, Father, so much. Father, forgive us, Father, for not trusting you, oh Lord. In the name of the Holy Spirit, I give it to you, every kid, every teenager, every parent, every father, Father. I give it to you, Father. Father, we need you more and more. We need you more and more, oh, Father. You are amazing, God. We give it to you, Father, all our needs. Amen. All Amen. our needs, not the ones. All our needs, Father, that you know what we need, Father. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you lay your hands and give to the Lord? Just give to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Tony, sing the chorus one last time, then we'll set them down, okay? We sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God, and he's worthy. Worthy. Somebody beside you and tell them Jesus loves you and he's good. Amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Exalt Church. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. As you came in, I'm sure you got a worship packet, and inside it is a Let's Connect card. If you are a first-time guest, if you could take time during the service to fill this out. Now, we've made it super simple. You can fill it out here on the Connect card, or you can scan the QR code located on the front of it. Um, if you want to scan that, you can fill out the Connect card that way. We just want to thank you for trusting us 
with your time. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. There's a place on this card for a second and third time guest. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us again. And if you're a regular attender, this is the perfect place to update your information as it's one of the primary ways that we communicate with the church. There's also um, different boxes here to get connected. If you have prayer requests, please mark those. We do pray over these during the week. Go ahead and fill this out. Like I said, you can scan the QR code, or if you fill it out, you'll turn it in to the um, boxes, the kiosk in the back of the auditorium or in the hall. At this time, we'll release Exalt Kids. So all our Exalt Kids head on back to the back. The volunteers and the red shirts are ecstatic. They're excited to see your kids this morning. Big round of applause for them as they head back. We also have Exalt Nursery back there, so let people know as you invite them that those um, Exalt Kids and Exalt Nursery is available for our kiddos. Um, with that, as Pastor Roger had mentioned, October 1st, we are celebrating our sixth birthday as Exalt Church. Absolutely. And we will take up our annual building fund. We take this up once a year. So please pray over it. Um, search your heart. And uh, we'll take up that offering October 1st right here in the auditorium. So please pray over that as we prepare for the future and we celebrate the six years that we have been Exalt Church. Um, with that, inside your worship bulletin, there is a co um, connect group card. So if you check that out. Now, we have new connect groups. We have returning connect groups. We have a young adults connect group. We have men's uh, connect group. There's a prayer group. There's a marriage group. There's a men's group. There's an adventure group. You see how my tone just got higher when I said adventure? Woo! I like an adventure. So anyway, sign up. For a connect group, um, we want to get you connected. We don't want you to do the life alone. So go ahead and fill that out. You can turn it in at the kiosk, like I said, here in the auditorium or out in the hallway. Um, from there, along with connect groups, right now we're going to release the student connect group. So if you guys are here in the auditorium, head. To, that's right. Whoop whoop. Head on back to the back. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I always like how she does that. So connect group for the student uh, student connect group is. Uh, meeting right down the hall. So we have um, groups for all your kids here at Exalt. So whether it be Exalt Kids, the nursery, student ministry, uh, connect group, head on down. Um, we're so glad that we have those. With that, I went completely brink. Um, we are not taking up the offering the way that we, you know, we are not going to pass around the buckets and stuff like that. So we are phasing that out. So we've made it really, really easy for you guys to give. There's an envelope inside your worship packet. And if you check that out, there's many ways that you can give. If you wanted to write a check, you can write a check right now in service. You can put it in that envelope, put it in the kiosk in the back of the auditorium. You can text to give. This makes it super simple. If you wanted to text to give right now, you can do that. Like I said, we're not going to take up an offering. We're not going to pass around the buckets. So you can text to give. You can go to exaltchurch.com. There's many ways that you can give regardless of how you give. Thank you for partnering with Exalt Church. Like I said, there's kiosks here in the auditorium. They're in the hallway. Thank you guys for partnering with Exalt Church. And with that, prepare your hearts, prepare your minds as we continue our series, Dear Church, and we welcome Pastor Roger Pate to the stage. Well, good morning, everyone. We are in our series on the seven churches of Revelation. And have you felt like you've been through a root canal on some of these churches? Wow, it has been strong medicine on some of these churches. But what I am excited about today is uh, this is a church that is a healthy, vibrant church that Jesus Christ doesn't give a single correction or warning too. Now, over the last uh, several weeks, we have seen an example of a church that fought valiantly against error, but they weren't a loving church. They were a mean to people church. We saw a church that exhibited love, but yet when it came to the doctrine in the Bible, they were doctrinally unhealthy. We saw a spiritually alive church that was martyred and their bodies were actually killed. And then we saw a physically alive church, and yet they were spiritually dead. And then we, last week, 
also saw a dead church that no one persecuted because you don't persecute the dead. And so the church was dead and they had no persecution. But today we're coming to a church that is faithful. Today we're coming to the church of Philadelphia that's healthy. Today we're coming to a church that needed no warning, no correction, no condemnation. They received only the praise of Jesus. Now, I find this interesting. Out of the seven churches, only two of them were healthy. Only two churches out of seven were healthy. So I am not a mathematician, but I believe that figures to about 29%. 29% of churches that Jesus addressed were healthy and the others were not. Now, here's the point. I can't be legalistic about this, but I do think there's a hint that oftentimes unhealthy churches far outnumber healthy churches. Amen. That ungodly churches far outnumber Ungodly churches outnumber godly churches. I, I believe that spirit-filled churches are less than those churches who are actually filled with the Spirit. And, and that should be a warning to us in our culture today. And, and let me say this. If you're here listening today as a guest, if you're here as a regular attender, or if you're watching us online today, what causes you to look for a church? And oftentimes people say, well, I look for a church because it has a good worship team. Or I look for a church because they have a great youth ministry. Or I look for a church because of their kids' ministry. All of those are okay, but let me say this to you. Because some of you may, be, may not be with us forever, and you may be transferred by the military, or you may move. I think the number one thing you look for a church is this. Is it a church that teaches the Bible as the Word of God and teaches it thoroughly and stands upon the Scripture. Because if you're in a church that is actually teaching the Bible and teaching the Scripture, that's a healthy church you want your teenager in. If you're in a church that is teaching the Bible and the Scripture, that's a church that you want your child in. So it's not whether or not they have a kids program or not, and I thank God that we have a kids program, but you may find yourself in a place where they don't have a kids program, and you say, but they teach the Bible well. I would say to you, you would rather be in a church that taught the Bible well than be in a church that has a fantastic kids program. Don't shout me down. That's some good preaching. Because here's what we will do. We will often go to a church just because it has the, has the, 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 the wonderful programming. And it, has, it looks like it's alive and it has all of the things going on there. The reality is you need to be in a place today that's proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the word, and stands and says that this book in all of its totality is the word of God, and we don't remove from it, we don't, we, don't, we don't retreat from it, but we proclaim it in its totality, all right? And I would argue, guys, that you're in a church here that does that. Now, I am not against programs. I like programs. I'm not against youth ministry or children's ministry because hopefully in that kids' ministry, and it's happening here, they're learning the Bible over there, and in our youth ministry they are, but sometimes we get so caught up in the trappings of all the programming and we sacrifice what really matters. And my friends, I would say to you what really matters today in this age is the Word of God because this is not in the notes, but the Bible says there's a day coming where there will be a famine for the word of God, where people will not hear the word of God, and there'll be a famine because pastors and preachers aren't preaching the word of God. I did not intend to say any of that this morning. With that being said, stand with me, turn in your sermon notes, if you will, to Revelation, I believe the third chapter, and verse 7, and I have forgotten my reading glasses here, so I'm going untethered today, all right? So give me some grace if I misread a word here. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. Jesus says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. And I know that you have but a little power, and yet you 
have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but they lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you because you've kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of the Lord, you may be seated. Let's jump in here quickly and let's talk about the city real quickly. And why do we do an overture of the, of the text? Because if you can get the context, you can get what the message is. So the city of Philadelphia is not the one on the eastern seaboard here in the U.S. that makes a great cheesesteak. It's not the home of the Eagles, praise God. For all you Dallas fans, really praise God, all right? Now, with that being said, the city of Philadelphia was founded in 189-190 B.C. by a guy who loved his brother so much. This guy was the king of Pergamos. And he loved his brother so much and so uniquely that they gave him the nickname Philadelphia. And when he founded the city, they named the city Brotherly Love, or they named it Philadelphia. It was a city of rich agriculture. It was a great place for wine to be produced there because of the grapes. And it had a lot of earthquakes. In fact, it had so many earthquakes that the city had to be rebuilt over and over again. They were used to aftershocks, okay? It was a place that was constantly shaken. If you will, it was an outpost of the Greco-Roman world. So basically, it was a missionary city, but they were missionaries for the Greco culture. They were a missionary city for Roman culture, and they spread the Greek language from Greece all throughout the Orient. That is who Philadelphia was. They were on the Imperial Post Road, which was the most prosperous trading road uh, in Asia Minor. And as I said before, they were stricken by earthquakes all the time. Guys, show them the map real quickly there, just so you can see where the city of Philadelphia is on that map. Now I want to talk to you about the church for just a moment, the Church of Philadelphia. First of all, we know very little about the Church of Philadelphia. In fact, the only place in our Bible that mentions the Church of Philadelphia is right here, what we're talking about right now. There's nowhere else mentioned to about it in Scripture. So who started the Church of Philadelphia? Bible scholars believe, and I believe, there was a group from Ephesus that came over at sort of Philadelphia when Paul had been in Ephesus for three years. So that's the backdrop, that's the background, but I want to spend the rest of the time talking about the correspondent of the letter or the sender of the letter. And I want you to look again at verse 7 and listen to these words. And to the pastor of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One. The true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shut and no one will open. We are not going to get past verse 7 today. We'll come back next week and I'll finish Philadelphia next week. But I think it's so important to understand what's going on here that I had to pause for an entire message and talk about it. Whenever Jesus addressed the churches, he, he, he wrote his letters or presented his letter like they all did during that time. Today, you and I write a letter, Dear Honey, Love Your Husband Roger. Or, Dear IRS Agent, I am mad at you, Sincerely Roger. 
But in this culture, when they wrote a letter, the writer of the letter's name came first. So that when you read the letter, you knew who it came from first, much like your emails today. You see the email at the name at the top, and you know who wrote the email. And so here is Jesus saying, introducing himself, that I am the one who is sending this letter to the churches. And know what Jesus does. Jesus never said, I am Jesus and I'm writing you. No, he always gave these descriptions of his character. And as you read this, this opening introduction, he says, I'm the holy one. I'm the true one. I have the key of David. I open and no one shuts. And I close the door and no one opens it. It has a very Hebrew sound to it. It has a very Old Testament sound to it. As I've said over the last several weeks, that if you want to understand Revelation, you've got to understand the Old Testament because there is so much Old Testament informing your book of Revelation. And this is happening right here. And he says, first of all, he says, I want to write to you and I want to tell you who I am. He says, first of all, number one, he says, I am the Holy One. I am the Holy One. Now, this is important, because who in the Bible is called the Holy One? God is always referred to as the Holy One in the Old Testament and our New Testament. For your Bible scholars, your mind goes to Isaiah chapter 6, where the angels cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, I believe Tony read that verse today. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Holy One always refers to none other than God himself. And I gave you all kinds of verses in your sermon notes where you can go back and read it later. But look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 25. It says, To whom will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. That's God speaking. In Isaiah 43 and verse 15, God says these words. He says, I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One. And so when Jesus is writing the church of Philadelphia, he is saying, I am not just a prophet. I am not just a teacher. He is saying, I am writing you as the Holy One. I am God. The Father and I, we are one. Do you remember in Mark chapter 10 when the rich man came to Jesus and he says, good teacher? And Jesus begins to play a little bit of a back and forth wordplay with him. And he says, why do you call me good? The only one that is good is God. Wink, wink. You're talking to me. I am God, holy, a little rich leader. I am God. And, and you're calling me good because you think I'm a teacher, but you're actually talking to God and you're asking me, how should I get into heaven? And he told him, keep all the commandments. And the guy was very proud. And he says, I've kept all the commandments, but Jesus. Jesus, being God, knew everything about the man. He says, no, you fell in one area. Your idol is money, and you worship money. Go and give everything away. And the Bible says the young man left heartbroken because he had great possessions, and he loved the possessions more than he did God. And when Jesus said to him, he says, do not call anyone good but God. And he says, give your possessions away. I find it amazing Jesus only asked him to do what Jesus had already done for him. Jesus had already given up everything in heaven and became a man. Jesus had already bankrupt himself to become a human. And he was asking this man to do exactly what God had done, that he gave up the praise of heaven and became a man. That's a freebie right there. So when Jesus says, I am the Holy One, he's saying, I am God. There is none like me. The second thing he says, why, why is he holy? What does the word holy mean? The word holy means to be separate from. What are you separate from? Well, God is holy. He is separate from sin. And because he is utterly separate from sin, he is utterly unlike you and me. He's holy. He's perfect. He's pure. 
The Holy One also means that, number two, that He is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. The Holy One, the common title, is for the Messiah. Is that not up there, guys, the Messiah? Okay, it's in your notes. Uh, and so he's also the Messiah. And so in Mark chapter 1, we see this time where Jesus comes in the synagogue and he's teaching. And in the synagogue, as he is teaching, uh, the scribe said, this man teaches as one that has authority and power. And he doesn't teach like one of ours. And all of a sudden, a man possessed with a demon began to cry out and scream and said, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? I know you are the Holy One. And then when the angel came to Mary and said to Mary, said, Mary, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you are going to give birth to a child. And Mary says, how can I have a child? I know not a man. And the angel said to her that the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you and so that you will give birth to a child and that child will be what? The Holy One of God. In John chapter 6, all of the disciples, they're leaving Jesus and they're abandoning Jesus. And Jesus says to his disciples, why are you leaving me? And they said, because of your hard words. Your words are too hard. Your words are too blunt. And we don't want to hear your teaching because you're saying you're the only way. You're saying you're the only salvation. And so they were upset that, of what he said. And Jesus said to Peter, are you going to leave me too? And Jesus, Peter says to him, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It was Peter who stood up on the day of Pentecost and he proclaimed, you disown the Holy and the Righteous One and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You chose Barabbas over the Holy One. And so here is Jesus identifying himself as saying, I am God and I am Israel's Messiah. That is who I am and I am the one writing you. Now this is amazing to me because God the Holy One cannot tolerate sin. God the Holy One does not wink at sin. God the Holy One does not deal playfully with sin. No, God the Holy One dealt with sin severely upon the cross, and he died upon the cross. Why? Because sin was such an offense to him. It was a major thing. But here is what I love about it. Here is the Holy One with piercing eyes, and he says, I know everything about you. Here is the Holy One saying, I am God and I am the Messiah and I am separate from sin, but I, I look at you, Philadelphia, and I know everything about you, but I give you no correction. I give you no rebuke. I give you no warning. I give you no judgment. Wow, what a healthy church. Now the church is full of imperfect people. And because people are imperfect, they form a community, and that community is imperfect. And it is, it is multiplied over and over when you have imperfect believers joining an imperfect church. Now it's a multiplied, imperfect group of people. And yet, here is Jesus, the Holy One, looking at an imperfect church. And he says, I offer you no correction. Do you realize that the church can be healthy enough? Do you know that the church can be righteous enough? Do you know that the church can be pure enough that when Jesus Christ looks at it, he says, I accept you and you're doing a good job. I have no correction. That should give us some encouragement today. Because over the last several weeks, we've had root canal after root canal after root canal. Do you realize that Exalt Church, although never perfect, can come to a place where Jesus Christ looks at us and says, well done, way to go, I have nothing else to correct? Are we there yet? Absolutely not, we're nowhere close. But he can. And then Jesus says these words, number two, he says, I am the Holy One. Then he says, I am also the True One. He has absolute holiness and he has absolute truth. In Revelation chapter 15 and verse 3, those who are taking notes, write it down. He says, great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. 
not only does Jesus Christ give truth, he is true himself. Not only does Jesus teach truth, but he is the author of truth. He is the revealer of truth. He is the person of truth. He said of himself, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. In the midst of so much false, in the midst of so much deception, in the midst of so much perversion, here is Jesus in the midst of major error, and he says, I'm truth. Look to me, I am holy and I am true. And here is he saying, I am the genuine one. I am the authentic one. I am the one with integrity. I am the whole, W-H-O-L-E. I am the whole one. And I am the holy one. And he says, I'm truth. And he says to this, he says, although I am absolutely holy and although I put a premium upon truth and my holiness and my truth have scrutinized you and my holiness and my truth has looked at you I have nothing to condemn I have looked at you through holiness and truth and I know you're a human church and I know you're an imperfect church I know you struggle with sin. I know that you fail, and I know this, but receive my graciousness, Jesus says. He goes, I have nothing to correct in you today. So Jesus says, I'm the Holy One. I am God, and he says, and I am the Messiah. And then he says, I am the true one. I am genuine. I am authentic. I am set apart from myth. I am set apart from lie. I am true. There is no hypocrisy in me. What you see is what you get. And then number three, he says, let me tell you who I am. He says, I am the one that holds the key of David. Look at your neighbor and say the key of David. What does a key represent? Whenever you see a key, a key represents authority. A key says you have authority. You don't like that word? Let me throw this one at you. The key represents complete control. Because what does a key do? A key and the one who owns it has the authority and has the ability and has the control to unlock a door or lock a door. If I give you a key to my house, I have given you the power and the ability and the authority to enter my house, unlock the door, and come into my house. If I withhold a key from you, I have withheld from you the authority and the power and the ability to come into my house legitimately or legally. And here is Jesus. He says, I have the key of David. Well, what in the world does that mean? In 2023, I'm glad you asked. Because I knew when you read this, you thought, I hope Pastor Roger talks about the key of David. Hallelujah. First of all, here's what it means. It means that Jesus has the power. He has the ability. He has the authority to pour upon you his royal riches at any time that he wants. You say, Pastor, where do you get that at? Write it in your margin of your Bible or write it in your notes, Isaiah chapter 22. There's a man mentioned there by the name of Eliakim. If you're looking for a name for your boy, great name, Eliakim, right there. And Eliakim was actually the keeper of the treasury of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah had prospered so much that the treasury was full of so much gold and so much wealth. And Eliakim was given the king, the key of David's treasury. He was given the ability to go into the treasury, open up the treasury, and give to whom he wanted the treasures that were in the treasury of King David. He had the authority over the royal riches. He had the authority over the bank account. He had the authority over the credit card. He had the authority over the stock market that he was trading in. He had the authority of it all. 
And when Jesus looks at the church of Philadelphia, he says, I am God, I am the holy one, I am the genuine one, I am the true one. And not only that, I have the key of David. I hold the power to bless you or not bless you. I hold the power to prosper you or not prosper you. At my own discretion, I can will what I'm going to give you and what I am not going to give you. And this is very important because some of us have made the mistake that we think that our jobs and our savings accounts and our employment and our careers, we think that they are our providers. But here's what happens. Businesses close. Businesses terminate you. Businesses downsize. AI takes over. And if your hope is in the business, at some point the business will dry up. And listen, God says, don't put your trust in the, in the money of this world where moth doth corrupt and where rust does destroy, and where thief does rob. Because here's reality, that job can come, that job can go. In a downsized market, it goes away. But he says, put your hope, put your trust, not in the instrument of God's blessing, but put your hope and your trust in the source of God's blessing. Do you see that? Your job is an, is an instrument of God. It is not God. Your stock account, it is not God. It's an instrument of God that God may choose to bless you with. Are you guys watching me or watching the girls walk over here? God is the source. God is the source, and what we have is the, is the instrument. It's the instrument, and we put our faith in the instrument, and when it dries up, we're shocked and say, well, God's abandoned me. Do you remember what God told the prophet Elijah? He said, I, I want you to go down to the river, and when you go down the river, he says, I'm going to give you water from the brook, and you're going to drink water from the brook, and then I'm going to send you a raven who is going to deliver you a hamburger in the morning and the night. He's going to bring you bresh, bread and flesh in the morning, and he's going to bring you bread and flesh in the evening. That's a hamburger to me, guys. And he's going to bring it to you. And what happened? Elijah went down and got his McDonald's delivery hamburger by Grubhub, and he's having a good time, and he's drinking the water, and one day he wakes up, and the brook is dried. And the ravens quit coming. The instrument dried up. And what did God say? God said, Elijah, get up. And go down here to this woman's house. She's a widow woman, and she's going to take care of you. The point is this. God was the source, but he uses instruments. And sometimes if we're not careful, we put our faith and our hope in the instrument. We put it in the instrument of a doctor. We put it in the instrument of a financial advisor. We put it in the instrument of a counselor or a psychologist where our hope and our faith and our trust should be in the source. It should be in God. And if you do that, you'll be able to pivot when a door closes. If you do that, you won't lose your faith when this world gets topsy-turvy because you realize my faith and my hope is not in stuff. You say, Roger, what do you know about that? I have lived by faith my entire adult life, beginning at 17 years old. And I've watched doors open, I've watched doors close, I've watched God come through and bless me. When this instrument went away, he brought another instrument in, and my hope has to be in him. So he says, I have to keep David. I can bless you or I can curse you. I can give you blessing or I can withhold blessing. But not only that, it also speaks about entry into the kingdom. It speaks about salvation. And so he's simply saying this. He says, I have the ability to unlock David's house. I have the ability to let you come into my kingdom. I have the ability to allow you to become saved. I have the ability to forgive you of sin. He says, I am the way. He says, I am the door. He says, no one comes to the Father except by what? By me. He says, I have the sovereign authority to let you in the kingdom. You can't get to the kingdom through Buddha. You can't get to the kingdom through Muhammad. You can't get to the kingdom through your own good works. You can't bribe your way in. He says, no, I have the key, and I unlock the door or I lock it. I have the authority to let you in or keep you out. I can shut the door or I can open the door. 
So here's Jesus saying, I'm riding you, church. And he says, wow, you're doing such a great job. He says to the church, you're doing awesome. He says, you're doing wonderful. You're, you're doing great. He says, I am who? I am the holy one. He says, I am the true one. He says, I'm the one with the key. And then he says this. I'm also the one who opens and closes doors. Wow. Taking notes. Write it down. If he shuts it, no one can open it. If he opens it, no one can shut it. And this speaks about the sovereignty of God. That he is El Shaddai. He is the almighty God. And he has absolute authority to open and to close. Here is Jesus talking to this church at Philadelphia. And he says, I'm not going to correct you. I'm not going to chasten you. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to rebuke you. He says, I am God. I am holy. I'm true. I hold the key of David. I can pour out prosperity upon you. I can let you into my kingdom. I can open a door, shut a door, close a door, swing it wide open. And this holy God, this true God, this powerful God, this all-knowing God looks at Philadelphia and he says, great job, guys. Wow, how, how much encouragement is that, that the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God, the ever-present God looks at you and says, I don't rebuke you. I don't correct you. I don't warn you. But we'll see next week. But I have opened a door wide to you. Amen. Because it can be pretty heavy. And we've gone through these churches and we can see his correction and his promise and his comfort. It, it, it can become very heavy and we can say, wow, does anyone do anything right? 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 Picture the Holy One, the Holy God, walking among you, looking at you, and saying, the world may curse you, but if I choose to bless you, the world's curse doesn't stand. Walking among you, and he's saying, if I accept you, if the world rejects you, it doesn't matter. The world calling you all kinds of names, but if I call you holy and good, what they say, it doesn't matter. We want to be that Philadelphia church. Amen. We want to be that church that we have responded to what he said and he doesn't have to tell us a second time and we want to receive the Savior and we want to recognize something, my friends. We want to recognize that he is God and he is in control and we're not. Amen. Do you know how freeing that is? Do you know how freeing it is when I realize the pressure is not on me to set you straight it frees me up a whole lot I once told a friend of mine and you've heard me say it before I've said you know what there's times as a pastor I just wish I was a mortician <laughs> you say why that's pretty morbid no as a mortician you lay them out straight and they stay straight <laughs> once you lay them out they're laid out they don't back talk. They don't roll their eyes. They don't ask you for a different advice. And when you give them advice, they don't go to someone else and ask for their advice and come back and tell you that poor advice. You lay them out, they're straight. That's right. That's right. As a pastor, you lay them out and they get crooked again. <laughs> Amen. The point is this. I, I don't have to lay you out. That's not my job description. 
I turn you over to God who's able to do what he needs to do in your life and he is sovereign and he's in control. And listen, my friends, I wanna talk about him being in control because as the times get darker, I'm closing, and the times will become darker. You'll have a chance to become pessimistic and you'll have a chance in your life to start struggling in your faith and and not believing in God. And when things don't happen the way that you want, how is the biggest way that I get through most of life? I pause and look to God and I say, God, you're good. You're all powerful. You love me. I trust you. If you open a door... I trust you. If you slam the door shut, I trust you. If you open up the treasury of heaven and you bless me, I trust you. If you withhold the blessing at this moment, I trust you. Because you alone are in control and you alone are God. I can't heal people's bodies, but I know one who can. I can't save your wayward teenager who's running from God, but I know one who can. And that's why I come to him and say, God, I depend upon you, the holy one, the true one, the one who holds the key of David. What you lock is locked and what you unlock is unlocked. I pray God unlock their hearts. Only you can unlock their hearts. Unlock their hearts. Open them to you. Amen. 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 Did you receive that today? Amen and amen. Stand with me if you will. Father, you are the Holy One. Jesus, you are the Holy One. You are the true one. You are the one with the key of David in your hand. You unlock and you close, and you're the one that opens doors and closes doors. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you know us in our totality. You see us where we're at. And Lord, we receive that encouragement today. We receive your love today. We're thankful that you're a God that we can please. That you're a God that truly wants to accept us. Jesus, you take no joy in correcting or rebuking, no more than a father takes joy in correcting his children. But Lord, today I'm glad you look with your eye upon us and you see us exactly as we are in this church of Philadelphia. And you lay no other burden before us, but you commend us. Father, may each person in this house run the race, keep the faith, fight the fight, so consistently that when each of us stands before you, There won't be a correction, but there will be the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. May it be so, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tony, why don't you lead us out in a worship song. Holy. Jesus Christ, the saving one, oh, praise his name forever and ever, amen. We're so glad you joined us today. Have you, have you been blessed today? Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless. We love you. Have a great week. Go out and worship this week. 
and bring it back with you when you want to come next week, all right? We love you. God bless. We'll see you next week. Oh, one more time we sing. Yeah.